Good afternoon. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining us. Um, on behalf of the Center for the Study of the Presidency and Congress, we're pleased to uh, have you with us uh, for what should be a very interesting discussion on an important uh, national security uh, and economic topic facing our country. Uh, CSPC, as many of you know, has uh, been engaged on topics related to uh, national security, geotechnology competition, primarily with China, um, for advanced technologies uh, and how we can best perfect this um, mix of policies that the United States can pursue to protect our own uh, national interests and also take into account the economic realities of a globalized world to continue to engage in trade um, with friends and adversaries uh, in a way that benefits the United States. Um, this series of conversations has uh, led us in, in many directions. We'll be releasing a report, an updated report very soon on our view of geotechnology. And that competition uh, informed by a series of discussions we've held this year. Today, we're very pleased um, to have with us to open uh, the conversation on this topic, the Acting Undersecretary for Industry and Security at the Department of Commerce, Cordell Hall. We're very pleased to have you. Um, Mr. Hall brings a, a wealth of experience um, and knowledge to this topic. Um, basically, having worked many areas of, of the issues we're going to discuss today, including overseeing export controls um, at the Department of Commerce, uh, participating in the Committee on Foreign Investment in the U.S. decisions about how we engage um, and trade with foreign companies and how we allow or control their investments in U.S. markets. He has also served as a Deputy General Counsel um, and acted as the Assistant Secretary for Legislative and Intergovernmental Affairs at the Department of Commerce. Um, prior to that was a General Counsel to the Permanent Select Committee uh, on intelligence in the House of Representatives. So Mr. Hall brings us a, a very interesting mix of perspectives, having spent time in the executive branch, but also understanding the challenges of, of moving a Congress and particularly trying to make policy in a time where uh, politics can, can be polarized, um, you know, trying to be responsive to an American electorate that sends um, various signals about how it interprets our relationship with countries like China, how it, it interprets the importance of, of business and trade and balancing that with national security. So we appreciate him being with us. Um, Undersecretary Hull, I want to offer you the opportunity you know, to lead us off today and maybe share some thoughts. You, you've obviously got a lot of perspective to bring, maybe some lessons learned um, from your current position. How do we get this balance right in terms of crafting policies that allow us to trade and get investment and grow our companies, but also compete with com countries like China who have as a national strategy to win that battle with us um, and, and to try to let their system determine kind of the way the world will look in the future? Um, obviously something we'd like to prevent. How do you balance all those things? And, and thank you again for, uh, for joining us today. Well, thank you. Thank you, Congressman Nye. Thank you to the CPSC for uh, for the invitation. I'm always always pleased to be able to, to come and, and have, be able to have a discussion uh, with, with a group like this. And uh, to, to, I guess I'll answer your last question first. Uh, it, it's it's really a challenge. I, I, a former colleague uh, once said to me, well, gosh, you seem to live in a world of it depends. And I said, well, for some things that's that's absolutely true. And other things it's it's not. For most things it is. Um, one one aspect of my background that I think I, I probably should emphasize is I also spent nearly 10 years in the private sector uh, before coming into government service. So I, I've seen a number of these issues from varying perspectives, but um, it, it's, it's engagements like this that I think really help us uh, as a bureau and as a department think about these issues. And uh, we've been certainly busy this year on, on a number of topics. Um, we've, we've done uh, a few things and I'll, I'll go through some of those more broadly, but it's uh, I, I'm, I'm supported by a team of over 400 people. Uh, we have everything from from badge carrying, gun carrying, law enforcement officers to uh, engineers and any sort of discipline you can imagine. And and those are the folks who really are thinking about uh, on, on the on the tactical level, thinking about uh, whether a particular piece of technology can go to this particular destination and use for this end user to this end user. Um, and then it's our enforcement guys that are making sure that that actually happens. But it's it's a struggle and and I'll tell you I mean I've done three or four calls today on on very very um, uh, 
difficult issues on on these topics on on figuring out considering foreign availability of certain things and and it's something that that we spend a great great deal of time on um but I, i'll give us a couple highlights if i can on kind of what we've done this year and and then um uh, hopefully within that i can at least give some some views on on how we've done things but um i certainly read uh, andy kaiser's white paper with interest i mean a number of those Topics are well in our bailiwick. Uh, I mentioned you mentioned CFIUS, uh, as did the paper. Um, but we've also been very busy with Hong Kong, military civil fusion, particularly with uh, China, Russia, and Venezuela. Uh, we've we've made a number of tweaks to our authorities uh, over the past past year or so, in, in particular on the MCF front, and, and a number of entity listings. Um, and and we're we're doing that is is really part of this um, part of this process to try and ensure that. The technology that we have here in the U.S. is not used against us, to put it not put not too fine a point on it, um, and that's that's been a whole of the department and, and frankly a whole of government issue on this. Um, as folks on the call are undoubtedly aware, our, our statutory authority, our recent, relatively recent, permanent statutory authority derived from ECRA, uh, Export Control Reform Act of, of 2018. I had the great privilege to work on that legislation and its companion CFIUS legislation, FIRMA while I was on the Hill, and it's it's really quite rewarding to be a small part of the uh, talented team who are trying to implement this. Um, but we've we've been taking a, a, str a strong look at our control list, our CCL, Commerce Control List, uh, contains over 500 categories of uh, product categories, and, and we're ensuring that those really keep pace with the technological development and the geopolitical events. I, I mentioned Hong Kong earlier. Uh, we've, we've suspended license exceptions to Hong Kong uh, given that it's no longer uh, distinct from China in terms of uh, the, the freedoms that the Hong Kongers had. So that's that's been something we've been working on this year. But again, the military civil fusion has been a big piece of that. Um, we, we imposed a military end user rule that applies to about 49 or so levels of, or 49 or so categories of technology um, and, and trying to tighten that rule up and ensure that we're uh, that we're, we're capturing things that are going to the military end users or at least getting visibility on uh, on items that are going to military end users in China, Russia, and, and Venezuela. Uh, we've taken an, another a number, a couple of other actions. We've increased the the number of uh, folks on the entity list. I think we've got 300 or so China-based entities on there. Uh, the, the biggest one, I think, for the last couple of years at least, has been Huawei. And as we sit here today, we've got uh, 150 Huawei and 153 of its entities or related entities on our entity list. Um, we've taken some some steps to try and uh, tweak the, the foreign direct product rule, uh, which is a, a rule that essentially regulates the U, the use of U.S. origin uh, design software, EDA design software, or semiconductor manufacturing equipment. And and at least judging by the company's own words and and some of the, those of some of our allies, we've been uh, we've been successful in that. Um, we've also tightened the entity list to uh, to cover. Uh, parties acting as intermediate consignees and purchasers, as well as ultimate users and, and consignees of, of items. Um, but we've we've continued to work on this, and it, it really is a, a massive struggle. But we've we've been using the entity list, I think, in uh, in a way that that helps uh, helps ensure that we're we're continuing to protect national security. Um, we've we've added a number of of companies uh, again, in addition to Huawei and, and others. Um, but we've also taken steps in in the human rights realm, and I think that's something that's, if I if I could suggest, been maybe underreported. Um, we've taken action against 15 Chinese AI companies uh, for surveillance in the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. Um, we we've taken uh, a number of steps. I think that uh, that have been articulated in the paper in terms of of bulking up the entity list uh, using the military end user rule. And, and that, that is only one part of it. The, the BIS portion of this is, is really more of the protect side of, of um, export controls and, and technology. And my, my friends down the hall in our International Trade Administration uh, really have the, uh, the ball on, on sort of the promoting side. And, and many folks on this call have probably seen the administration's strategy for emerging and critical technologies. And it really had the two pillars of protect and promote. And uh, we've got a, a number of folks working on some of the great legislation on the Hill uh, that to helps uh, maybe some, onshore some of this production, uh, particularly in the semiconductor realm. Um, so that's that's something that that's been a whole of department effort, really. Um, we, we at BIS have also been working uh, apart from exports, at least uh, as apart from traditional exports. We've been 
trying to help the department implement the uh, president's executive order uh, 13873, the supply chain, uh, ICTS supply chain EO. Um, that's been something that's that's taken a lot of effort to do, and, and BIS has been fortunate to play a small part on that. But um, another thing we've tried to do, and I, I'm going to try and keep my remarks uh, fairly brief so we can have uh, sufficient time for the question and answer, but we've been really trying to work with allies uh, through the Vassanar Arrangement, Australia Group, and others, uh, really to, to reinforce the point that, that export controls are, are generally most effective uh, when they're when they're done in a multilateral forum. Uh, that said, we as I think is this year and and years recent years past have shown we're we won't hesitate to go it alone when we when we think we need to. Um, but we've been we've been doing a, a lot of work uh, multilaterally. We've put out uh, 37 rules on emerging technologies, 36 of which we worked through the multilateral arrangements. I think of particular interest, uh, certainly with Andy, with respect to Andy's paper. We put out an advance notice of proposed rulemaking on foundational technologies, the comments for which were due yesterday. Uh, I think we've got about 70 comments uh, on that, give or take, and the team is already at work uh, analyzing those. So we're hopefully trying to get at some of the problems identified in the paper uh, through the foundational technologies reg. Uh, again, mentioned CFIUS at the top uh, of the call, and that's something that has been, uh, notwithstanding the pandemic, CFIUS has remained quite active and, and the department uh, plays a strong role in that, as you can well imagine, given the, uh, the types of, uh, of companies out there. Uh, I think the white paper mentioned a couple of, of companies in the technology semiconductor space that have been blocked uh, in, in recent years. But um, we, we really have been quite active. I, I don't see us slowing down anytime soon. Um, you know, in addition to the, I've, I've touched largely on the policy side of things, but our enforcement folks have, have been busy as well. I think we had, uh, highest amount of prison time and highest number of, of fines in FY19 uh, ever. And uh, we've, we've been active on our administrative enforcement docket. But um, it, it, again, let me, let me just wrap it up with these are issues that we are spending a great deal of time on. These are issues that I think will uh, transcend. Uh, I think they certainly transcend uh, traditional party politics. I think it's something that uh, the, the whole of the US government uh, including uh, our, our Article One friends, are awake to the to the issues we face on these. Uh, it's been I, I can tell you, having served in our legislative uh, office up here and and now serving here and having been on the Hill, I, I can't remember seeing so many NDAA amendments that that touched on these issues. And it's really it's really a testament to the understanding that folks in in the U.S. government, again, Article One and Article Two branches, uh, really get this. So with that, I will stop uh, looking forward to uh, to Chairman Rogers' remarks and uh, looking forward to the discussion. Well, let me ask Dan, do we do we have um, Chairman Rogers connected yet? No, unfortunately, Chairman Rogers is not connected. We're having a trouble connecting him to Teams. Okay. I apologize. Yeah, it's OK. I, I can see that he's sort of on here, but not quite active. L let me, if I can, then, um, Cordell, I'll ask you a, a couple of follow ups. And, and one, I wanted to pick up on your last point. Um, you mentioned you'd worked in Congress and, and talked a little bit about coordination there. But can you go into a little more detail about um, how easy or hard has it been to get Congress to move in the same direction you, you think they ought to move policy wise? Um, any surprises or um, particular challenges you think um, you could provide any advice in terms of overcoming in the future? I, I don't, I, there haven't been a lot of surprises. I think, um, I, I mean, maybe maybe pleasant surprises that in that um, when I started on the Hill in, uh, in, in 2015, I don't think there was as crisp a recognition of the problem set in this area. And I think over the past uh, six or so years, we've, we've really seen, a, awakening is too strong a word, but a, a realization on, on, frankly, both parties, I think have been, uh, deserve, some, deserve a fair amount of credit for this, of the problem sets we face. And uh, you know, I, I, I talked to the, the China, House China Task Force earlier this year, and, and one of their questions was sort of, what can we do? And I said, just continue to project that this is a whole of U.S. government thing. This is not a party politics issue. Uh, I think the more that we as a government can project that, uh, and it, it fortunately happens to be true, uh, but the more that we can project that externally, I think the, the better off we'll be. But it's uh, no no real surprises, but again, a pleasant surprise that that folks are seeming to realize that uh, writ large. Yeah, I, I have the same feeling from our perspective that, that the problem is now understood to be important, and so there's a tension. And the question then is just, can you coordinate well enough you know, one of the problems with whole of government, it's great when everybody agrees on the on the problem. 
one of the problems is getting all these pieces and players who agree that the problem is important to actually move in a kind of semi or coordinated coordinated fashion. Can you talk at all about, you mentioned Wassener and the need to sort of approach the export control question from a multilateral point of view. Any particular difficulties there? How did you see that unfolding? It's, it, it's a challenge because it's a challenge getting everyone to buy into it. And it's a challenge. Nobody wants to take that step. And, and it's, it's hard to convince governments to turn to their industry and say, this benefits us. This is to our collective good. And, and so that's, you know, that's always been a challenge. I think it will always continue to be a challenge. It's easier when you're able to do it in a 30 plus uh, member arrangement like Boston R or Australia group. Um, but it's a lot, it's a lot harder also to do when you're doing it on smaller levels if you're in a quad for instance or if you're if you're simply bilateral or trilateral uh, to get to get in to get countries to really sign on to this because they know they're going to hear from their industry and and so it's really trying to ensure they understand the threat picture understand that the steps that we're asking them to take have at least to our minds, we've tried to tailor as narrowly as we can to avoid collateral damage. And it's something I probably should have emphasized this a little bit more. The, the amount of time we spend on trying to think of second and third order effects when we have a new policy coming down the line. Uh, my, my very first question to the team is almost always, what does day two of this look like? It hits the federal register. What, what are we going to see the, the, day, the day after this? And, and so I want my team thinking through that as we make these policy decisions. And it's one of the reasons our engagement with industry and other stakeholders is, is really so important for us to do. What do you see are the trends in, the, in our multilateral partner arena? Are they trending to seeing things more kind of similarly than we do or different? Because it seemed to me like at least on Huawei, before Mike Rogers testified at the UK uh, parliamentary committee, um, there wasn't a whole lot of agreement, and I, I don't know how much was due to Mike Rogers' testimony, but it seems like in that area, things are starting to move yeah. closer to the way we see it. But what, how do you see the trends overall? I, I think the trends are positive, and, and I'll, I'll invoke Chairman Rogers here for a minute. I mean, in this country, we have recognized Huawei as a threat for since at least 2012, since, since his great report from, from uh, his former committee and my former committee. Uh, so from, from a at least part of a U.S. government perspective, we we had that recognition eight years ago. I think other countries are starting to come around and it. We've seen the U.K. Uh, obviously take some positive steps. The uh, the Indians have taken some positive steps. I think I just saw some 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 good news out of Sweden on that front. So I think the trend lines are generally positive, and I think it's it's something that we as a government have been grappling with uh, for for you know, almost a decade now. I think other countries are starting to to understand it. I think they're they're starting to. Uh, whether we're we're having, you know, sufficiently robust exchanges that they're now getting it, or that they're getting it through their intelligence or commercial channels, uh, but I think the trend lines are largely positive. Let me ask you. Let me ask you a more process question. In terms of, you know, one of our goals with this this forum is to help facilitate conversations between the government and private industry, government including various executive branch players and Congress. Um, and I'm interested in just your thoughts on how that dialogue has gone. Are there lessons learned and things we could do better? Or what is your take on sort of that back and forth? Sure, I, I will start off by saying the the interagency. It's it's a mistake. It would be a mistake to think of the interagency as a monolith. Um, there are deeply held views and and occasionally, or more than occasionally, conflicting views on on certain things. Mm -hmm. And so I guess if if I could give some advice is to really uh, blanket blanket the agencies that you're that you're you want to talk to and really make sure you're getting out and, and hearing from from folks in my position or, or folks in uh, other positions in, in those other agencies because I, I think if you talk to I, I don't think I mean I don't for instance think there's going to be a macro level disagreement of um, we should sell anything and everything to anybody in the world but I but there are nuances I think that that if, if you talk to different agencies you, that'll become a little bit more apparent. Um, that said, we we have a robust policy process in the U.S. government that uh, hashes that out. But um, it's it's interesting to to get perspectives from uh, from other agencies. I mean, our friends at the State Department are always thinking the diplomatic side. DoD, of course, immediately thinks of what what does this mean for the warfighter? All things they should be doing. And and so it's it's a useful process. But I would encourage you to to get out and talk to some of those folks in this area as well. Thank you. I I do want to. Um 
in a moment ask Dan to start bringing in some of the audience questions and Dan may also have some um, things he wants to, to put in front of you. But I did want to ask you um, just to tell us about other technologies you think we should be focused on. We, we've looked uh, closely now today at, at semiconductors. We looked at some data, other data technologies. Um, you know, we, 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 we put on the table artificial intelligence and quantum that we haven't dug in quite as deep on some of those yet. But can you just give us your thoughts on what would you put on the list of the most important sort of critical technologies? You, you just you just name our artificial AI, quantum, um, uh, 3D printing is certainly something that's that's uh, now that we, we now have jurisdiction over over firearms. Um, so 3D printing is is uh, subject of litigation, so I need to be, be careful what I say, but it's something that we think uh, a lot about as well. But AI and quantum, I think, are, are definitely top of mind for us uh, in the non-semiconductor space. Well, I, I think that's that's good to hear. I mean, we, we also identified those relatively early and got really into sort of the personal data and data governance spaces because we started to recognize how important having a large marketplace for data is. Uh, China's yes. kind of got a lock on a large marketplace and no rules. You know, we have rules, but they're not necessarily really clear. Europe's got very clear rules, but some challenges with those. And if we can work better with our allies in Europe and Japan, for example, and come up with a common sense uh, sense of how we can protect data, you know, we can compete in that AI marketplace. So that's kind of what led us to do the focus on AI technology. Absolutely, and data. I mean, data is a tough issue. I mean, the the European Court of Justice with the Privacy Shield decision earlier this summer. I mean, that's it's those are naughty issues, and 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 that's a another piece of the department. But that is something we're going to have to work through in order to get at the AI question to to ensure that we know what we're doing with data and where where that data go. Let me ask. Thank you. Let me ask Dan Mahaffey to to come in here because I, I know we've got some questions coming in uh, from the audience and help us field those. Uh, the first question I have from the audience is, do you see areas where technology is outpacing our necessary policies and how would you propose to close those gaps? I think uh, the short answer is a, a little bit. Um, one thing to keep in mind, at least with respect to our controls, is our controls are generally a technological floor. So anything more advanced than that typically gets captured. Um, but that said, I mean, it's it's we try to move fast, but we are a we are a government. We have uh, interagency processes, and we try we try our best to, to do it. And there are times where we put uh, put rules out. We put one out, uh, an emerging technology rule out earlier this year on uh, geospatial AI software, and that that was something that we moved quickly, and we hope to to get it within uh, get it into Vasanar uh, shortly. But it is something that that occasionally we feel like we have to go out and and. Put a marker down on something uh, unilaterally, even. Uh, but it's it is it is a challenge because technology is is not constrained by the or is less constrained, I should say, by the by the bureaucracy. So we it's something we have to work very hard at. Uh, another question, and I, I'll forgive my uh, colleagues from our commercial spaceflight program, but I will uh, ask on behalf of them anyway. Uh, how have you seen that field expand and grow? during your time and, and your thoughts on that field's importance in protecting that? Uh, it's it's huge and I'll tell you from from the perspective of the department, it is it is one of the secretary's big priorities and I, I will get the number wrong, so I will not say it, but it was something of, of he's expecting it on the order of tens of billions of dollars a year by 2040. Uh, it obviously has, uh, has export control dimensions for us. There are a number of uh, space programs in, in countries that um, we are I'll say uh, um, sometimes leery of, and so it's it's something that we need to really ensure that uh, things that are marked for commercial space actually are going to commercial space, um, and that's that's something we spend a fair bit of time on as well. Uh, thank you. And then the the final question would be, you know, in terms of the great powers, we obviously talk first and foremost uh, about China. But are there other nations on your radar that you have concerns about in these technology areas? Uh, in these technology areas, I mean, it, it, it's, it really is China and then everyone else. Uh, but we're, we, we remain concerned about the Russians in a number of areas, including this. Uh, we, we, certainly, uh, we certainly want to ensure the Iranians are not, uh, not moving forward with, with uh, these, these sorts of uh, building on these technologies. Uh, so too with the North Koreans. Uh, again, I think you know 
maybe on the le less on the great power competition, but we, we certainly have great concern about what's going on in, in Venezuela as well. Um, and, and so we are uh, constantly looking at, at largely those nations, but there's there's uh, a, a number of other areas where we're concerned as well on particularly non-proliferation type issues. But on, on these technologies, it really is China and kind of everywhere and everyone else. And then the final question I have, um, how has the uh, Bureau worked or cooperated at all with academia, the, the focus on secrets that are be stolen from universities, industrial yep. research there? Um, any more comment on that, please? Sure. Well, our, our Office of Exporter Services is, is frequently in contact with, with academia and, and uh, the export control uh, savants on the call probably know that it's uh, um, foundational research is something that's outside the context of, of export controls by our own regulations. And so it gets very tricky sometimes going into a university. Uh, there's occasionally that pushback of you're interfering with academic freedom. That said, I think we generally have a very good relationship with it. And it's something that, that we do have an office that largely engages with them on that to really ensure that we're keeping these technologies protected, uh, even if they're, if they're not uh, subject to formal control, we're trying to ensure that, again, that folks aren't coming over and using the freedoms of, the, of, of this country to, again, use our, our technology against us. That is, uh, that is of course, a, a focus of BIS. Well, before we move on to the, to the next panel today, let me just say thank you very much to Acting Undersecretary of Commerce for Industry and Security, uh, Cordell Hubble. We really appreciate you sharing. Um, some knowledge gained from private sector, Congress, uh, and various parts of the Commerce Department, but really focusing on some key issues of technology competition and national security that we've identified as, as vital to the future of our country. So we thank you for your service and for, for your work and for being with us today. Thank you for the invitation. Dan, over to you and to set up the, uh, the next panel. Thank you, Secretary uh, Hall. Thank you for your time and it's my a pleasure to now introduce our next panel, and uh, this will be on our semiconductor research paper available on our website. But without further ado, I want to introduce our senior advisor and the author of the paper, uh, Andy Kaiser. Andy Kaiser has worked uh, for the House Intelligence Committee. He's worked at Navigators Global, uh, the George Mason National Security Institute. He's been everywhere on this topic and one of the true geotech champions in this town. So uh, Andy, I turn it over to you to get the uh, discussion started on your paper. Great, thanks everybody. And uh, great to be on with, with Mark and Susie uh, to discuss a, a pretty timely issue and uh, you know, taking a minute to talk about something that is not election results or something related to that is, is uh, probably welcome for for all of us, uh, just just given uh, that the craziness of the season, uh, part of the reason I wanted to write the paper was just like I had some nervous energy built up. So um, uh, obviously, thanks to Dan, uh, Congressman Nye and uh, Chairman Rogers uh, as well for their awesome work in this space uh, at the center and their leadership in general. Um, and building off the sort of the geotech uh, series uh, that the center has has been running um, decided to take a kind of a hard look at the the rapidly growing Chinese uh, domestic semiconductor industry obviously semiconductors uh, uh, Susie knows better than anyone are, are are so essential to almost every aspect of our lives these days whether it's the phone in your pocket or or your smart TV at home or whatever mobile device of choice you have um, but sometimes we forget uh, every weapon system, every every technology the military uses. It's an essential component there uh, as well, uh, all the way down to, to tanks and airplanes uh, rely, of course, on on circuits and semiconductors. Um, so, you know, as I kind of as we kind of went through the the scope of the problem and what the industry looked like. Um, we've seen in the last 10 years this, this pretty rapid growth in China with uh, three of their domestic companies uh, in particular. Uh, they all have acronyms as uh, known, uh, well known among the Chinese tech companies, uh, ZTE and, and the rest. Um, but uh, for the semiconductor purposes, SMIC, CXMT, and YMTC are the 
uh, latest three growing players. The more established brand is the the high silicon uh, chip maker for for Huawei. They are a, a fabulous, uh, which means they don't manufacture their own chips, but repurpose others. Uh, a, a fabulous found, foundry in China, exclusively devoted to Huawei. They are a subsidiary uh, of Huawei, established in back in 2004. Um, and of course, Huawei is uh, well known to have uh, close ties to the Chinese military and intelligence service. Um, and, and you mentioned my the committee work. Uh, Chairman Rogers uh, authored the 2012 Huawei report, uh, which is still uh, referenced to this day. And I, I joined the committee shortly after that. So been working on the, the topic for a while. Um, and when we look at what the Chinese government is doing in chips, um, we don't have to look too far to other industries. So as they did with telecommunications infrastructure, as they did with LED light bulbs, as they did with a handful of other industries, they have tasked the Chinese military and intelligence services to go out and steal intellectual property uh, around the world. They capture that, repurpose it back to state-owned uh, enterprises. They secure a captive market in China of the, of course, the second biggest economy in the world. Um, and they can do that with quotas and, and tariffs on, on foreign competition. Um, they inject uh, billions of dollars into state uh, sponsored research and development. They uh, offer seemingly endless lines of cash from state, state banks. Um, and then when the industry gets uh, ripe enough, we're starting to see some of that now, they're happy to flood the global market uh, with uh, items that are, you know, at or below cost in order to capture market share. And those predatory practices have, have had major success in, in a lot of these tech areas uh, that we're seeing around the world. Um, then in the paper, we, we looked, kind of did a, a deep dive on the national security threat specifically to, uh, to the semiconductor supply chain. Um, of course, uh, I mentioned, uh, let's see, everything from fighters, satellites, bombers, tankers, armor, armored personnel carriers all use and rely on semiconductors. Um, and, and, and one of the Chinese companies in particular has a a, a well-known relationship with the, the Chinese People's Liberation Army, the, the PLA, um, SMIC, they uh, have actually, uh, you just had Secretary Hall on, they have been uh, designated with uh, having to have a military end user requirement um, for anyone doing business in the U.S. with them. So they've been dinged, dinged with that. Um, of course, it's important to remember, and we talked about this a lot in the Huawei context, that all Chinese companies are required to uh, comply with the Chinese military and intelligence services, including semiconductor companies. Um, so they all operate under those uh, that legal uh, structure under a 2017 law. Um, let's see. So uh, one other thing we want to think about in this space is as we as we go uh, to an economy of the future that relies on things like 5G and artificial intelligence and autonomous vehicles, the Internet of Things, all of those technologies will will rely on uh, and be powered by semiconductors and, and securing that supply chain um, and ensuring a, a robust domestic production just becomes all, all the more the more important. Um, then we went into some of the policy responses that we've seen to date, some of which uh, Secretary Hall discussed. Um, CFIUS, it's interesting, in their, in their, let's see how long they've been around, 45 years or so, there have been five uh, transactions that have been blocked and three of them have been related to semiconductors. So it's obviously a, 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 an issue of, of concern at, at the CFIUS uh, committee uh, run by the Treasury Department. Um, let's see, one thing we did not mention is uh, the company uh, Genoa, 
uh, we wrote in the paper was uh, added to the entity list uh, a couple of years ago and actually they ended up uh, going out of business um, and shutting down. So now we focus on the, the remaining uh, Chinese semiconductor companies. Um, let's see, uh, the last thing we looked at, there's a number, there's a, a handful of items in the Congress that we can get into uh, perhaps during Q&A that, that folks are looking at. Uh, one of them is in our recommendations. We have six uh, that I'll quickly go through as far as what we're looking at, um, recommending to, to address this, this threat. Uh, and that's adding the, the three Chinese companies, semiconductor companies I mentioned to the entity list, uh, SMIC, CXMT, and YMTC, concluding the uh, foundational technologies uh, regulations that uh, Secretary Hull discussed uh, uh, thoughtfully um, and in fairly short order, continuing the, the sort of diplomatic pressure we're seeing from the State Department uh, globally, uh, including uh, adding semiconductors to the clean network initiative that uh, the State Department has launched under Keith Kroc. Um, you know, we call for uh, providing incentives for domestic uh, manufacturing and production. So there are two items in the Congress, the, the Foundries Act and the, the CHIPS Act that call for a robust uh, U.S. Uh, research and development investment, tax credits, and the rest to uh, make sure we have a strong domestic capacity to compete with uh, our, our global competitors, including China. Um, I called for expanding the uh, defense uh, uh, industrial base to semiconductors. Um, if we think of, you know, protecting supply chains for tanks or uh, fighters or other uh, obviously key uh, supply chains for uh, the DOD, uh, it wouldn't something like a semiconductor production be that important to protect as well. And then uh, finally uh, prepare for what we all would know, all know would come next, which would be uh, some type of, of Chinese uh, retaliation either directly proportional and related to those uh, technologies and restrictions or, um, you know, perhaps asymmetrically out of, outside of those, but uh, in, a, in a different industry or area. So um, with that, happy to turn over to the other smart folks on the panel or the smart folks on the panel, I should say. Uh, thanks, Andy, and I'm going to turn it over to uh, Susie Armstrong here next. Susie is the Senior Vice President of Engineering for Qualcomm. Uh, also one of the, uh, you know, true gurus of the mobile internet whose expertise I have come to appreciate uh, from everything from the, the spectrums to uh, which iPhone to buy and all those things. So she answers it in a way that a, a humble policy wonk like my under, I myself can understand. So Susie, thank you for joining us and I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Dan. It's always uh, interesting and an honor to be uh, uh, on some of these uh, events. So thank you again for inviting me. Um, so the topic is securing advanced technologies, and that's certainly a critical topic to U.S. government and industries alike. I'd like to turn it a little bit in my initial comments to the offensive as well as the defensive. Security, whether it's cybersecurity or national security, really starts with innovation. If you look at where the U.S. is in, it is in terms of technology leadership and how we got here, it's historically been supporting and driving innovation. The patent system, the research that's gone on in government labs, in academia, and increasingly in U.S. private industry, and the purposeful actions by the U.S. government over the years to make sure that U.S. companies are not regulated out of global markets has been critical to this technology leadership. So basically, supporting the ability of the U.S. to run faster in technology. Those proactive forward-leaning initiatives should be supported and enhanced. For example, there's a lot of good discussion um, right now in Andy's paper and uh, in, in the press and in the government on uh, supply chain uh, security and semiconductors. And um, one of my key points is is an area of focus needs to be not only how we bring manufacturing back on shore, but how we maintain leadership in the design of these semiconductors. 
because it's in the design that the security is set in those devices. It's the designers, it's the engineers that design them that, uh, you know, make sure that they don't have um, vulnerabilities that uh, uh, make sure that the, you know, the security features of uh, 5G actually get implemented in, in the chip. Uh, make sure that, you know, it has the right encryption and secure environments, uh, you know, secure execution environments, etc. So um, I think that's a really important point to 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 bring out. And the second important the related point to bring out is uh, that that design support requires funding of R&D. The US industry funds their R&D via access to global markets. Uh, uh, both for sales and also for manufacturing. So I believe the semiconductor industry and certainly um, Qualcomm reinvest roughly 20% of their revenue year over year into R&D. And that is actually what maintains that technology edge. We don't get, you know, we don't have a big semiconductor fund that we get uh, uh, funded with for, uh, you know, technology development. So. While surgical and strategic um, USG measures to ensure advanced tech does not inadvertently escape are really important, those measures need to be, as we were talking about and Undersecretary Hull was talking about before, they need to be narrow, they need to be targeted for sensitive technologies, and they need to be multi multilateral. If they are not, and if they, they then risk having the unintended consequences of closing off some of these markets, and these measures risk damaging the very thing that we are actually trying to protect, which is US leadership in advanced technology. And that is a, a really essential point. And the semiconductor industry uh, is, is uh, you know, has partnered with the US government and export control for many, many years and is very concerned about uh, national security and intellectual property uh, theft etc. But I think we we cannot lose sight of um, it, it's important to secure to put in these blocks and to secure technology and to look at it that way. But it's also important to see how how we actually keep the US maintaining the leadership that we have in some of these areas, semiconductor, uh, some AI, quantum, uh, in, instead of uh, just a, a defensive approach. And Andy, um, your paper was excellent uh, and interesting, always interesting. Um, good bedtime reading, and I didn't mean to send me to sleep. <laughs> uh, but um, one of the points I wanted to, to mention is, um, you know, you, you have a recommendation that um, BIS should add some of the, semi, the Chinese semiconductor uh, companies to the, the entities list. And uh, I think you have to look hard at the unintended consequences of such a thing and both in retaliation, but also um, in terms of, uh, you know, perhaps, you know, putting in some sort of a phased approach to uh, to make sure that that kind of capacity exists elsewhere. Semiconductor capacity runs at 90 to 100 percent worldwide. We're always trying to everybody's all the designers are always trying to get more space in in fabs. And I, I think if if those kinds of things are not taken into account can have a, a significant dis disruption. Um, and and I'm just going to also bring up it's not related directly to semiconductors, but I'll bring up one of my favorite unintended consequences with Huawei on the entity list was to the actual uh, standards for 5G. Um, as as I think everybody knows, 5G standards are standards leadership is um, critical to the development of that the R and D and the development of the of that technology. And um, when you know a company like Huawei is put on the entities list, nobody wants to run afoul of export controls, right? Everybody takes it very seriously, and so there were uh, there was a lot of discussion about the chilling. Of had on technical discussions that happen to build consensus around standards contributions. And the ultimate result of some of those, those kinds of actions are to isolate the US, to have a chilling effect on US and allied uh, companies participating rather than on, on China. 
So it's just an example sort of at a non semiconductor level of something that I don't think any of us anticipated. And so in all of these measures, I think it's really important to have um, industry input and to also in the long term look at at um, you know what what funds industry R and D because that's what's actually keeping us ahead in these these areas. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Susie. Thank you for your comments and the perspective from Qualcomm and industry. Very important to consider the capacity retaliation. We'll we'll get to more of that in Q and A. But I want to introduce next uh, Mark Montgomery. Mark Montgomery is the executive director of the Cyberspace Solarium Commission. Uh, before then, he was the policy director for the Senate Armed Services Committee uh, and also served a, a long career in the U.S. Navy as a flag officer uh, with notably a, a stint as J3 for uh, PACOM. Uh, so I'd like to turn it over to Mark, uh, who talks about some of the, uh, the context of the threat from China and securing cyberspace. Thank you, Mark. Hey, thanks, Dan, and it's great to be here with uh, Andy and Susie. Um, like you said, I'm uh, executive director of the uh, Cyberspace Solarium Commission. We're set up by the uh, Senate and House to um, look at, come up with policy and legislative remedies to to um, establish a, a more secure um, environment in, for our critical infrastructure in cyberspace. We came up with about 80 recommendations. A lot of them are in the current NDAA. Um, and I think 20 to 25 will probably become law over the next uh, month or so. But in addition to those recommendations, we did have a specific uh, uh, recommendation which we haven't taken action on yet legislatively, uh, but we plan to over the next year to reduce our <clears throat> critical independencies on untrusted information and in, in our information and communications technologies. And really this went along with some recommendations we had about improving intelligence and information sharing around supply chain risks that we think is necessary uh, for the government to work with private sector and do a better job of sharing that information. But core to our commission's recommendation uh, was the creation of an, really an ICT industrial based strategy. Words you didn't normally think you could get Republican senators and congressmen to sign off to, you know, five years ago, but now no problem. Um, and really the goal is to ensure a more trusted supply chain and the availability of, of uh, critical ICT technologies going forward. I'll be blunt about it. I think Cordell Hull was as well. Um, in the context of supply chains for ICT, the United States does have a China problem. You know, over two decades, China's mobilized state-owned and state-influenced companies to, to grab a dominant position in markets for several of these emerging technologies. Um, it's no accident. It's the result of a concerted strategic effort by the Chinese government to capture these markets. There's a mix of things in there. Some of it's uh, government-led industrial policy. Some of it's unfair and deceptive trade practices. Some of it's uh, state-led intellectual property theft. The Blair Commission reported over a trillion dollars of theft over 15 years of, of unrealized GDP in the US. Some of it's the manipulation of international standards and trade bodies, maybe because we're not there, but it's generally happened. And a, a growing network of influence built on the back of diplomatic and trade negotiations that they, they've had um, as part of the Belt and Ro uh, uh, BRI uh, initiative. And then some of it's because of significant investments in R&D by the Chinese. So, I mean, it is a mix of, of things we would recognize as things we do and things we would recognize as things we wouldn't do. But in the end, the result of this uh, it is a critical strategic competition between China and the United States and between China and the United States and our friends and partners. And it's taking place in an international system of commerce that due to this Chinese state intervention is really not free or fair. And it's hampering the ability of American and partner companies to compete for a global market share. And you know, I'll take it and, and I'll wrap on this. I'll say two, two places where this context really matters. China's history of intellectual property theft and its institutionalized focus on indigenous innovation, those two things together. I worry about uh, non-Chinese companies being in Chinese chip manufacturing facilities and that idea of that really pre presents an excellent intermediary environment where the design of semiconductors developed by U.S. firms can be stolen and used in Chinese products. And I think we all know it's happening, happened and will happen. And we've got to figure out how to how to um, prevent that because these practices enable Chinese companies to be technologically competitive internationally while bypassing the R&D costs incurred by our companies. 
uh, in the United States and and, uh, and those in our allies. And, and I'll put a second uh, tag on this. I, we worry a lot about the um, the semiconductor manufacturing equipment companies, the one that there's Dutch, Japanese, and American companies that really produce these, and whether they're pro, um, applying the appropriate export controls. Even the U.S. companies, are they are they applying the appropriate export controls and you know that that to reflect the dual um, uh, the the the, um, the dual application nature of these um, uh, of these systems, and are they protecting our national security interests when they do it? You know, recently the State Department, and within the last few months, I guess maybe it was last, it was in January, the State Department worked with the Dutch to to block a, a sale by um, AMSL, the Dutch company. But you know, we have to worry about our own companies and and what they're doing there. We're we're not alone here. Uh, I mean, the Dutch are not the only uh, problems here. So I think in those two areas, what we're doing at our facilities inside China and whether it's really safe from intellectual property theft there and then whether we sell them the ability to skip generations of R&D investment. Look, our companies do. I mean, Qualcomm mentioned there, uh, Susan mentioned 20 percent. That's a significant investment. That's 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 not taking short term gain in order to have long term continuity of their product. If, if Chinese companies are able to skip that investment step, they put our comp they put our companies at risk in the in the future and I, and I think that's inappropriate so I think there's a government role to play in this we came up with a five and it's more, more than semiconductors we put it as a five step strategy and I could go through that in the Q and A but it's also in our white paper at www.starium.gov and I think you'll see it in in um, uh, legislation that gets introduced in the 117th Congress one last thing I'll tell you is. The United States is trying hard here and in, in a way it's almost, um, you know, it, um, I think Andy mentioned the Chips Act and um, Foundries Act and, and there's other things going on. The problem is we're not thinking strategically. We don't have a strategic plan with prioritized lines of effort and specific you know, responsibilities of what to do. As a result, you see all these acts coming in. There's a Foundries Act, a Printed Circuit Board Act, a Protect Act, there's an ORAN Act. Then there's, op, you know, um, a task force at Homeland Security, at Commerce, at Energy, at um, DOD, and finally there's a bunch of executive orders shotgunning out of the White House. <clears throat> I don't believe there's a strategic vision driving all these elements. So the first thing we're recommending is get a strategic vision. It makes sure the private sector is on board with it. Make sure your allies and partners are on board with it. Then begin to execute these things. Otherwise, what will happen is what we're seeing happen with the CHIPS Act, which is a good act, I think. But it has been stripped of its money at each stage of the uh, process as it works its way through the NDAA. And I think there'll be general disappointment when people see the, the end product um, for the people who sponsored initially. And what I'll tell you is it'll have the, an actual negative impact in the sense that people go, hey, we got it done. But instead of being $10 billion in tax guarantees or something else, it'll be $1 billion. So you, did, you didn't get it done, yet you have a false sense of, of doneness. Uh, not a verb, but still. Uh, so from my point of view, I, I think that that's what we're taking a look at. And we're going to figure out how to write a good legislative proposal to create that strategic vision to get the process going in an integrated fashion. We'll see how we do. Thanks, Mark. And uh, I'm, I'm not shocked to find that the, uh, the six year olds playing soccer approach to building a strategy on this where everyone runs after the ball doesn't seem to be working right now. Uh, but I'm, you know, Shocked also to hear that that's the case in Washington right now, but appreciate the work you're doing. I want to turn it over to Susie actually on this this first question because you described that strategic plan and the idea of uh, changing our supply chains. Susie, how does it how does one change their supply chains? We hear in Washington so often move to a different supply chain. What does that actually entail? Well, I'll take the negative side first, and then then um, you know some of the solutions that we can do. So to change to switch the supply chain uh, for a for any sort of um, complex chip, you know, we make microprocessors, we make power management chips, we make uh, all kinds of chips that go into the chipset. Probably takes close to two years, and that's twofold. That's both on on the designer's side because chips especially um, chips for, you know, specialized applications are, are um, the design has a lot to do with how they are manufactured. Uh, it takes a lot, not just to bring up a, a foundry, but to actually get 
you know, sufficient yield that, you know, you get one, you get more than one chip per, per wafer out of it when you're running, running production. So it probably takes a, a year to both qualify, design for that fab, bring it up, run the test runs, uh, close to two years and, and get the, and get, you know, close to, you know, some high percentage of, of yield out of what you're sending to that fab. There's also on the fab side, because of the capacity issues, because all these fabs are running at 90 to 100 percent, if you're going to switch major capacity from one foundry to an, to another, typically those that takes close to two years as well, because these are all physical processes. My background is actually software, so this is, you know, software, you can roll it in your own home. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, chip making and these tools for chip making require physical buildings, clean room environments, huge automation. And so that's it when you're looking at switching, you know, from one foundry to another, that's another major and then acquiring of the, the tools. That's a, a major um, impediment to um, switching. And that's one reason just to add, that's one reason I really like the, even though it may be like six year olds <laughs> playing soccer, I'm really happy to see uh, and we are really happy to see the discussion going on now in terms of how we bring manufacturing back to U.S. soil. I, you know, perhaps uh, differently than um, Mark and, and Andy, I'm not so concerned about the security in the chip being um, compromised, you know, during the manufacturing process, but I am concerned about access just because we are experiencing and we've experienced before and we will experience again this global capacity issue. And so if something was to happen, you know, most people's chips are done somewhere in Asia. And, and if something goes unstable there, then uh, the world is in a, a world of hurt. And the US, you know, whether it's, um, you know, the consumer or whether it's the DOD is, is in a world of hurt. So I, I think those conversations are, really valuable and I, I guess my my point there is um, the semiconductor manufacturing industry is immensely complicated and um, we should start now. It's like plant the tree now if we want to bring manufacturing back to US soil because you need a bit you need you know you need to look at leading node chips, you need to look at sort of accessory chips um, and it takes it takes a lot of money. It also takes talented designers, not just chip manufacturers, but tal talented designers to bring up those those factories. You know, and I talked a little bit about that before. So, and it takes a lot of money. But I think now, you know, I think sort of multilaterally, we're we're realizing this issue, and we would be thrilled to participate in those conversations. And uh, I see we're actually getting close to running out of time here, which it's such a great conversation in the in the detail there. Uh, Mark and Andy, real quick before I turn it over to Glenn, the, the final question uh, to talk about is we see this bipartisan uh, uh, agreement on uh, on China, on addressing it. And even after this very heated political uh, election season, how do we continue that that cooperation and dialogue on this topic. Mark, I'll, I'll go to you and then Andy for the, the final word before Representative Nye. And my one minute is like, you know, our commission is run by, we have four serving legislators on it, Senator King, Senator Sass, Representative Langevin, Representative Gallagher. Um, you know, these are four people who have political opinions. Our deliberations are completely nonpartisan. At one point, you know, Senator King was 100% not arguing what I would consider his party's position on you know, how money gets given to states to spend on election security. And uh, Senator uh, Representative Gallagher is 100 percent not representing his party's position on this. You know, and it, I didn't tell him afterwards, didn't need to. We, we ended up kind of in the middle of the road like we should. And and a couple of times I'd have to remind King who appointed who he didn't know who Senator McConnell appointed or Senator Schumer, or Representative Pelosi. He didn't know that he had no idea what the political standings were of any of these um, of the commissioners. Why is that? Because cybersecurity is an inherently nonpartisan issue. Now, look, if you put the word election in front of anything, it's partisan. So election security, cybersecurity could be a little bit, but that's one of our 82 recommendations. On the other 81, truly it's a nonpartisan issue. Now, look, 
Does that mean you're not going to have fights and problems with different industries that come in that represent different parts of the country and probably have a different uh, belief in what the role of China or, or some or another Asian um, competitor might be? No, you have a little bit of that, but it's a nonpartisan issue on its face. We can get cybersecurity right. And what's more important is this is an absolute money maker for the United States. This IT software and IT hardware are things we're good at. It's things are entrepreneurial kind of mindset, our engineering schools, you know, our dominance of the universities, maybe not the students at them, is what makes America effective. And so getting this right is important. It's a nonpartisan issue. I think we'll get there. I think rational minds will get us there. You're going to see a lot of it in this next NDAA, probably 25 hour recommendations. I'm tracking about 20 other good cyber critical infrastructure ones. And I will do the same again in, in the 117th Congress in the first year, and it's going to make a big difference in, in cybersecurity, in my opinion. I may be optimistic, but if I'm optimistic, I'm optimistic alongside Senator King and Representative Langevin. I like optimism. Andy? Yeah, well, I think we need Mark back in the SASC. That's what that's what I heard um, uh, to get, see these through. Uh, I, I share his optimism and I actually strongly commend folks to look at everything the Solarium Commission has put out. It's been exceptional. Um, but it's not often you find a report where half the recommendations uh, uh, make it into an act uh, that gets signed into law in the same year. Um, you know, one or two, you're doing pretty well. Um, so uh, particularly take a look at, at some of the things the commission's recommended on, on SMEs, sem semiconductor manufacturing equipment, as we were discussing earlier, but it's great stuff. Um, I, I'm very optimistic about where we're going on these issues. Actually, I, I, um, I understand the making the analogy that these things pop up and there's no coordinated strategy, but I do think there are a, there are a number of highly influential uh, members of Congress in, in the Senate uh, on both sides of the aisle from Speaker Pelosi to Chuck Schumer to Mark Warner to Marco Rubio uh, and all the, com the Solarium Commission members that, that Mark mentioned who wake up every day worried about about the, the multitude of threats from China and this is this is one of them. Um, it's rare to find this sort of overwhelming bipartisan consensus on, on, on a topic, as Congressman Nye knows better than, than uh, anyone on this call. Um, and so I'm very optimistic about where it's going. It's almost rare now. I'm, I'm actually, I get somewhat jarred when I hear a countervailing argument uh, that's more sort of the China argument from 20 years ago that if we engage more you know, reforms will come and that's in our interest and everything will work out. It's almost jarring to hear that message now because it's it's so rare. Well, thank you. Thank you to all of our participants in the audience for joining us today. I, I'll just pick up on that thread about bipartisanship. Sometimes partisanship is the biggest problem, but oftentimes it's not partisanship. It's just focus. It's keeping people moving in, in one direction, moving a large government, a diverse government system, on an issue and bringing in the voices of industry to make sure that we're listening. They're the ones who understand the technology and how rapidly it's changing. And so their voices are vital in the conversation. So let me just say uh, a special thanks, Mark, for your work on the on the Solarium, the Cyber Commission. Um, you've done the hard work, you've produced the recommendations. Uh, you know, now it's on people like us to keep, keep the attention on the issues. So thank you for that. And Susie Armstrong at Qualcomm, thank you for your thought leadership. Thank you for Qualcomm's partnership and also you personally for bringing an engineering and a manufacturing expertise that needs to be in the conversation. And finally, Andy, for doing the work of writing the paper and helping us do our job as a think tank of keeping focus on the issues where it needs to be, often the biggest challenge. Your work is much appreciated, Andy. And uh, just finally, thanks, Dan Mahaffey, for managing today's event. Uh, we were very pleased to put it on. Um, hope folks got a lot out of it. Looking forward to uh, seeing you all at the next event in this series. Be well and stay safe. Take care.